I write both nonfiction books and and literary fiction. I'm kind of quirky in that uh, I, I write in a number of different genres. And, and in my case, I've just always followed whatever interests me. Um, it, I suppose if I had been a career to do over again, I would concentrate on one subject. But I've just I've followed my muse in the sense that whatever's on my mind, I write a book about, and uh, it's made me happy. The last fall, I was deep into an issue of The Atlantic on a long flight home when I read Greg Easterbrook's piece about how the NFL fleeces America and the taxpayers. And the headline sounded a little sensational, but the article excerpted from his book clearly illustrated that it wasn't an exaggeration. From their tax-exempt status to their extraordinary access to public funding to their revenue sharing or hoarding, the NFL has concentrated a tremendous amount of taxpayer-funded wealth among a very select group. And, but at the same time, they've become a can't-live-without brand for us. All the more appalling, while all this public money is flowing to team owners with little or no proven ROI, it's not going to education and other more pressing needs. Reading the article was really an I-had-no-idea moment for me. And I continue to wonder, why aren't more people talking about it? In his new book, The King of Sports, Football's Impact on America, Greg Easterbrook fully develops this complex story and adds the college component. Money's still at the center of the discussion, but where it's amateur status, sportsmanship, and educational credentials that are sidelined. Greg is a contributing editor at The Atlantic. He writes the Tuesday morning quarterback column for ESPN.com, so much more than just football, and has been an on-air football commentator for ESPN and the NFL Network. And he's even a former high school college coach in this area. In addition to sports, he's written about economics, the environment, faith, and even fiction. Please welcome Greg Easterbrook. Thank you. I hope you can hear me. I know there's a machine running and John's gonna, John's gonna check, that, check that out. So thank you for coming. I will open with a joke about football. This joke involves the Redskins. Yes, I wish they would change their name too, but to tell the joke, I gotta use their name. So there's a man and a woman who have been hardcore Redskin football fans for 30 years. Season tickets, they go to every game, rain or shine, fat or lean years, they're always there. It's the annual Dallas game, biggest game of the year. The man walks in alone. He sits in his seat. A couple, a couple of minutes later, the guy who always sits next to him shows up, and he looks and says, hey, why isn't your wife here? And the man stares off into the distance and says, I regret to report that my wife has passed away. So they're quiet for a few minutes. Then the other guy says, looks at the seat, and he says, Wow, this is a big game. That's a really valuable ticket. Didn't, wasn't there anybody in your family or friends who wanted that seat? And the guy says, oh, they, they all went to her funeral. <laughs> so <laughs> so f football is immensely popular in the United States. Every year, it, it, uh, it's, you think it can't possibly get any bigger and any more popular. And every year, it gets bigger and more popular. And that may continue for some time to come. I think that has. The, the, this book, King of Sports, talks about what's good about football. There's quite a bit, and I actually would like to open with that. Also talks about what's wrong with it. It has deep-seated structural prob problems that need change. Uh, talks about why it is that the United States is the only country in the world where gridiron football is the national sport and wh what it means about our society. I will t just because we're here in Gaithersburg, I'll tell you that there's a couple of local figures mentioned in this book. I spend a few pages on uh, the sad story of a guy named I I Ike Whitaker, who was the Washington Post Player of the Year nine years ago, went to Northwest High School and has a sad story ever since. And and, and then the tragic story of Northwest graduate Derek Sheely, who died after a football practice two years ago. Uh, and I also mentioned, two, there's also interviews in here with two local coaches, Bob Malloy, who's a, a fine coach up at Good Council, and Azar Abdul Rahim, who was equally fine coach at Friendship Collegiate, although he just left high school for the college ranks. So there's a little bit of local flavor in here, although that's, that's not my intent. We live in a polarized society. When we talk about things, we tend to talk about them in a polarized way. You're either totally in favor of something or totally against it. That's what our politics is like. That's what our social commentary is like. So I found that the, the first thing that people ask me when I say my new book is about the social impact of football is they say, well, are you for football or against it? And I say, well, actually, it takes me 368 pages to answer that question. Uh, 
but I, I think we've lost sight of the fact, that, because of the nature of a national debate, we've lost sight of the fact that you can really love something and also want it reformed. I mean, that's the way many of us feel about the United States. We're, America's the greatest country in the world. We're very happy to be Americans, but we can still want the country reformed. And that's how I feel about football as a sport, too. It's a, it, it is the king of sports. My favorite sport, I've been to way too many football games. I have way too many in my future. I go to the Super Bowl every year. I played in high school and at the small college level. Uh, I have a son who played uh, in, 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 in the NCAA. I love the sport, and I also think it needs very serious reform, uh, and that we've just scratched the surface of the reforms that are needed. So let, let me first tell you what I think is good about this sport, because I, I know I'll spend more time on what's wrong with it. Uh, football has a lot of pluses. Football teaches millions of young men, mainly men, there are a few girls who play, but it mainly teaches young men how to be self-disciplined and how to respect the rules and how to engage in teamwork. These are all not only important life skills, but as society is developing, the ability to get along with people who are different from you and to engage in teamwork is increasingly important. Football is a good teacher of those skills, and we, we shouldn't, shouldn't ever lose sight of that. Of all the things that happens in high school, football involves the most people. It, there's the typical high school JV varsity team. Some have freshman teams. There's 100 kids involved. For every kid who's involved, there's at least two adults working in the background. And, and, and yes, the high school theater society and the band, and they also involve lots of people, but because football is so big, it involves the most people, and it brings people together. A lot of small towns, the glue of small town politics is the high school football team. And it's the place where people from different social classes meet and agree on things and work together. We don't have a huge amount of that in our society. Football provides it, I, I think that's good. Uh, there's a lot of civic pride associated with football, whether it's with your local high, high school team or with the, the university that you graduated from or the, the professional team of your school. Civic pride is a good thing. Uh, we need more of it. And it's civic pride that crosses lines of income, color. Everybody in America is interested in football. We can all talk to each other about it. Uh, I mean, yes, there, every big city in the United States has a great symphony and it has a great modern dance company, but realistically, how many people pay attention to them? Everybody pays attention to the pro football team. So it gives us something in common. And in a, in a, in a fraction, fragmented society, we need things that we have in common. We also forget the extent to which football was involved in the public education system in the United States. Today, a lot of people think there's too much emphasis of fo on football in high school, and maybe that's right. But if you go back to the end of the 19th century, when universal public education was first being offered in the United States and then being mandated, what got the Huck Finn boys of that era to high school was that they could play sports there. American high schools have more emphasis on sports than any other high schools of any other country in the world, in part because of the way they developed and the way they drew people into the sphere of high school Football was the lost leader for everything else that the high school wanted to go do, and it was successful in that regard. And then if you look at the great post-war development of public universities across the United States, before World War II, almost all, almost all colleges were private colleges, and in the main, only the wealthy attended college. After World War II, this country made this huge commitment to build public colleges and, and bring the average person into college very successful, football was part of the promotion of that. It made college campuses an exciting place to be. Go back 100 years, the Ivy League was the football powerhouse of 100 years ago. And you, you may know the name Robert Maxwell. Uh, the Heisman Trophy is the big prize in college football. The Maxwell Award is the number two. Robert Maxwell was the college football star for Swarthmore College, which, doesn't, which, which is now a, a little uh, elite academic school that doesn't even play football, but that, that's the way the landscape was 100 years ago. As higher education shifted from a preserve of a small number of people from affluent backgrounds attending private schools to available to almost everybody in a public setting, football was part of the promotion. It made college campuses exciting places to be, not mainly for men, but also for women. Today in the United States, we have the high, if you look at associate degrees and higher, 40% of American adults have at least an associate degree. It's the highest figure in the world. You look at the wealthy countries of Western Europe, the comparable figure is 29%. There are all kinds of problems with the way we finance higher education in the United States, but in terms of success, we've achieved it. We've, we've got more people who have 
holding a college degree than any other society in the world. And that's pretty good. And, and, and maybe that would have happened if athletics had never been invented. But I think you have to give the excitement generated by athletics some credit for that. Um, and, and, and to wrap up what's good about football, I'll say I knew that this book would be mainly critical. So I spend two, par two chapters in this book describing how the system at Virginia Tech, not too far from here, which I thought was an ideal compromise between winning 20 straight winning seasons at the D1 level and 77% graduation rate for their football players. If college football broadly graduated 77% of its players, college football would cease to be controversial. So I spend a lot of time in this book describing how they do it. Not, I don't describe who wins their games or anything like that, but I want to show that football can be done in an ethical manner that everybody's happy with, showing a real world example of this occurring and, and, and how they structure their program to do it. And I, I can tell you any college that actually cared about graduating its players could, could do the same thing. The problem is that most, too many colleges don't care. So that's what's good about football. Bad, holy smokes. Uh, concussions, everybody knows about concussions, but I think we talk about concussions in the wrong context. Nobody wants an NFL player to get hurt, but there are only 2,000 NFL players. There are adults who know what risk they're assuming and they're very well compensated. Four million youth and high school football players in the United States. Statistically, almost all football is played by children. Looks like about 65,000 concussions among high school players per year. Concussion rates among youth players are harder to estimate, uh, but, but not because they don't endure jarring hits. Uh, studies are beginning to show that youth players are endure hits with almost as much force of gravity or degrees of acceleration as college players do, not, just not as many. So almost the concussion crisis is happening to children, not to adults, even though, of course, we don't want an NFL player to get hurt. And as the knowledge of this sinks in, uh, the, the number of concussions that occur at the, at the youth and, and, and high school level and the cumulative effects of many small hits over time, as recently as 20 years ago, really recently as 10 years ago, people thought that the, that the hits that you worried about were the knockout hits where a player falls to the ground unconscious. And of course, you hope that that doesn't happen to you or your son. But it looks like the accumulation of many small hits is just as significant. So uh, uh, concussions, the first thing that we worry about. Second thing is painkillers. This is the next scandal that's coming. I might as well advance you, advance you to that. In the United States, we had last two years, we've had more deaths, overdose deaths from the use of prescription painkillers than we have from illegal drugs. NFL, very big on prescription painkiller use. Uh, they, won't, they won't reveal how, many pain, how, how much narcotic painkillers NFL players use. And, and how many of you here heard of Toradol? Anybody know what Toradol is? Anybody, a few people? Toradol is not a narcotic. It's, it's a chemi chemically, it's similar to Aleve. Uh, Probably a majority, although I couldn't get the NFL to tell me exactly what the number was, of NFL players are injected with Toradol before games when they're feeling fine. So they can play fearlessly because they literally won't feel pain. And so you get this great spectacle. The NFL is fabulous entertainment, entertainment value. I mean, just it's wonderful. I love to watch NFL games. But one of the things you see is these men fearlessly throwing their bodies into other men's bodies and jumping up seemingly unarmed. It's because they're on drugs and don't feel any pain when they do it. It's the following day when the drugs wear off that they feel the pain. And yes, they're adults and they know the risks, but young people watch that, see the example, and emulate it without realizing and then, and then the injuries that they suffer and the pain that they endure is unlike NFL players not compensated for. Uh, pro, football sport, pro football economic structure, Everybody gaffs when I say this. Did you know that NFL headquarters is a not-for-profit enterprise? It doesn't pay taxes. $10 billion a year in income, and the NFL pretends on paper to be a charitable enterprise. Uh, I mean, I'm not making, I wish I, this sounds like a bad Saturday Night Life sketch, but it's true. Congress, it's legal, it's perfectly legal. Congress allows them to do this. Roger Goodell, the commissioner of the NFL, paid himself $45 million last year. And on paper, he claimed to be administering a charity that serves the public. And that's why, he should, that's why the league shouldn't pay any time. I mean, it's just, it's a scandal. And you can see how weak, how weak and timorous Congress has become that they can't even, they can't even face this scandal. How are they going to ever face anything significant? Uh, uh, but n not only the, the larger money numbers involved, not, not only is the NFL headquarters, not individual teams, 
NFL headquarters is tax-free. Now, we assume that the individual teams are paying corporate taxes, but we don't know that since none of them reveal anything about their finances, and yet all of them receive public subsidies. Uh, public subsidy, about 70% of the cost of building and operating NFL stadia is paid for by the public, and then the owners of the teams keep 100% of the profits. Uh, well, why these things are not more politically controversial, I'm, I'm not sure. You look in the college ranks, as I've said, I think it's great that colleges play football. It makes colleges exciting places to be. It's part of the, part of the landscape. 55% graduation rate in Division I. It's not only lower, some, sometimes people say, well, where is that compared to what students as a whole of uh, colleges graduate? That's a good question. Students at, as a whole at Division I colleges graduated to 68% rate. So 55% not only lower, but football players are graduated at a higher rate. They get five years in college instead of four. They get all kinds of special tutoring, and by far most important, they don't pay for college. The main reason that students at public universities fail to complete their degrees is that they run out of money, and football players never run out of money. So your football players should graduate at a much higher rate instead of graduate at a lower rate, and it sure is not because they're going to the NFL. Um, I have a chapter in King of Sports, what I, what I call the grand delusion of football, and that is that everybody who becomes a football star is going to make money in the NFL, so it really doesn't matter whether they get an education because they'll be able to look after themselves. If that were true, it probably really wouldn't matter very much whether you got an education. The, the first few guys who were picked in the NFL draft this month it doesn't matter whether they graduated from college or not. They're going to be fine financially in life. But the overwhelming majority, including the overwhelming majority of the guys on the Florida State Championship team, will never get a paycheck in the NFL. The statistics are if you're on a high school varsity team, you have one chance in 2,000 of ever drawing an NFL paycheck. If you were on a Division I college football team, that's the, the, the big college level, you have one chance in 35 of ever drawing an NFL paycheck. So the overwhelming majority of guys who reach the top of the college ranks of the sport never make any money as professional athletes. And if they get, if they get educations and get diplomas, then that's fine. I personally think that paying college athletes is less of a concern than making sure they get diplomas for the simple reason that a diploma has more economic value than what they could be paid. Studies show that graduating from college adds about a million dollars to your lifetime earnings. Uh, that's far more than you could get from pay even if the big college programs distributed all their income as pay to athletes. So the economic value of the diploma is, is very real and more important than what you could, what you could, what you would make if college football players are paid. But 45% of them are not getting their, their their diplomas. That's the big, to me, that's the big scandal of college athletics. Um, now, reforms, yes, I think there are re there's there's a package of reforms that would solve all these problems. It will not be easy to implement, but it could be done. Uh, 100 years ago, football was on the verge of being abolished, and Teddy Roosevelt, who believed in the manly, vigorous life, got involved and called the leaders of the football establishment to the White House and got them to reform. I wish Barack Obama, who, whoever is the next president, would do the same thing, because I think it's going to take White House pressure to get the system reformed. But at youth football, first thing I'll tell you is I don't think you should play put on pads until you reach eighth grade. And a lot of parents don't want to hear that. Right around the corner, you've got the Rockville Football League, which is one of the best run youth programs in the country, very high standards. I don't think it should exist because health studies are bulletproof on the point that you should not expose your brain to injuries until you reach about eighth grade. And don't take my word for it. Take Archie Manning's word, the father of Eli Manning and Peyton Manning. He knew about the health studies. He would not let them to wear let them wear pads until they hit eighth grade. So I think that's should be the same for everybody. Concussion awareness is rising in high school and at the youth league. So, so that's good. That's a plus. At the high school level, football has become a year-round sport at high school level. People have mandatory practices in the off seasons. Seven on seven leagues, which is essentially glorified touch football, is now mandatory in, in most states for most high school football players. It prevents you from becoming a well-rounded kid, from doing the other things that you will need, extracurriculars and good grades. 
to get admitted to college when recruiters don't call, and statistically the odds are that recruiters don't call. I think it's very cynical of adults to impose on high school football players a year-round football requirement. And as recently as five years ago, that wasn't legal here in the state of Maryland. The, the sanctioning body for public school, high school sports in the state of Maryland, four years ago changed its rule from forbidding football practice from the end of one season until the big July of the following summer to now f mandatory football practice is allowed 49 out of 52 weeks of the year. Very cynical thing for adults to do to kids. The kids all believe that they're all going to get recruited to college and that mandatory practice is good for them. It's not. That's got to change. Uh, college reform, one of my favorite statistics. Ohio State, one of the big athletic powerhouses of the world, the athletic department has twice as many staff members as the English department. Even though far less than 1% of Ohio State students are, ever have any dealings with the athletic department and 100% of them deal with the English department. There's lots of skewed, the, the, the more money there is in football and the money in football is rising very quickly, the more temptation there is to skew priorities. There's 25 or 30 colleges now that make at least $50 million a year in profit on football. And like I say, my big objection is not that the players aren't being paid. My big objection is that they're not receiving degrees. Nick Saban has won the national championship three times. His latest contract, he's paid $70,000 per year. Per, that's not total, per, the, per player under his administration. And most of the players, you know, they're not going to the NFL, that's for sure. So the, the, the numbers are out of whack. The way you could reform it is all scholarships now are year to year. That means if you get admitted to Penn State on a football scholarship, good for you. That's fantastic. That's exciting. The scholarship only lasts for one year. The coach has to approve the renewal of your scholarship each year. That means if you, God forbid, should go to class instead of going to practice, your scholarship evaporates. If we had if we had multiple year scholarships, and I would say you should get your five years of athletic ability plus one more year so you can re repair your grades, grades and graduate. If college football players got six year guaranteed scholarships, the balance of power would shift, I think in a more dramatic way than if they managed to unionize, or, although maybe unionize is what, what's gonna happen. And I think that graduation rates should be included in poll rankings. You know that college football fans all very obsessively follow the poll rankings, and they matter a lot to what bowl games you go to. Suppose graduation rates were a third of the weight of a poll ranking. Human beings respond to incentives. Right now, the coach, the athletic director, the only incentive they have is to victory. If they've got an incentive for, a gra for education, they will respond to it. And I can tell you, I, I have a quirky part-time relationship with ESPN. I am right now trying to convince the senior management of ESPN to start a combined poll like that for next fall, to rank be the, the, the USA Today poll, the AP poll, and we're, I hope, going to call it the ESPN slash E poll that shows where these schools should rank were ranked if education were taken into account. And, and, and I think that will affect um, the, the way the sport is perceived. Obviously, at the NFL level, I think public subsidies, this is a very profitable business. It's absurd that they have public subsidies. The subsidies date to half a century ago when football was not so profitable. This needs to change, but I blame politicians mainly for it, no, not the owners themselves, who of course are greedy. That's no, that's no big surprise. The sport itself, changes are coming. Kickoff is the most concussion prone play. I think within the next five years, maybe sooner, kickoffs will be eliminated. Bob Malloy, the best co high school coach in, in Maryland high school history is around the corner. At Good Council supports this proposal. I think the three point stance is gonna be eliminated. Uh, if, you, if you look at the configuration of a, of a football play, nine to 10 of the players start in a three point stance with their heads down and the very first thing happens that their heads collide. If you don't allow the three-point stance, you have to start the play with your hands on your hips. Number of head-to-head -head collisions is going to go way down, and the quality of the game will, 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 be, will be just fine. You remember the, the forward pass was supposed to make the game sissified. The quality didn't change. Lots of changes in the rule structure of football have been condemned by traditionalists and turned out to be just fine. So I think when we do away with a two-point stance, that's going to be just fine, too. Uh, those are the, the, the main reforms I think are coming in the, in the way the sport itself is played. I think the big danger to the sport is 
not the NFL concussion litigation, which as you know is uh, a, a settlement's been proposed. A federal judge has led to ex yet to accept the settlement. That's only the NFL. The NFL has so much money, it can buy its way out of any problem. The big threat to football is high school concussion litigation. The proposed NFL settlement gives former players an average of $50,000 each. They are, after all, adults who knew that they were assuming a risk. So far, high school concussion litigation, the award has been an average of $5 million for injured person because the people who are injured legally are children and law treats injuries to children very differently from how it treats injuries to adults. Well, if that doesn't change, high schools are gonna stop playing football. It was public high schools, certainly maybe even private ones. Uh, insurers are gonna stop offering insurance and that's the big threat to football. And I'm, I'm hoping that that's what we'll get either our current president or whoever the next president is to do the next White House summit to, for big reform in the game. Now let me tell you one last thing and then I'll take questions. Why is America the only nation in the world that adores gridiron style football? I think there's two reasons. One is that we're the only nation that could do it. Football is the most expensive, the most complicated, the loudest, the noisiest, the most superficial, the craziest. Only America, only the country that went to the moon could pull off hundreds of football games every weekend in the fall. No other country could do this. We're the only country that can do it. But I also think it has to do with our national character. You don't think about the rules, don't think about the touchdowns, think about the essence of a football game. The essence of a football game is really powerful muscular men trying to express their masculinity within a context of rules. They're trying to see who can be the most muscular and most powerful, but without violating the rules. What's America been about, especially our foreign policy for the last 50 years? Since the end of World War II, we're the most powerful nation in the world. We're, the most, we're more powerful than all other nations in the world combined, and yet, we want to do things, we want to be good guys, and, and we want to show that we respect the rules of the world. So we're in constant torment, not just in, in, in Afghanistan and Iraq, but in many other places. How do we use our power, and yet at the same time show that we respect the rules? And that's what football is all about, and that's why it's so popular. Um, would ha be happy to take your questions. for former players you know a lot of these guys don't have trouble till later but you know a typical job if you say you work for five years and then you're out and you're in your 20s you don't get any health care going forward from your employer what does the NFL do and what do you think will happen there in the NFL there's been some progress on this the collective bargaining agreement that was signed in 2011 enables you to, to enables a former player as long as he plays for four years and that's the key thing statistically most players play for three and a half years but if you make it for four years you become eligible for a league policy that's a pretty generous policy you do have to pay a premium but it's a generous policy so any of the current generation of players anybody who makes it for four years if they buy the generous policy that's now available they're going to be they're going to be fine previous players on the day you were cut your health care ended and you're on your own and the, the league does not want to hear about it with a few minor exceptions. But that's, that's the way it still is in the NCAA where there are far more players, 2,000 NFL players. There's almost 50,000 college players. Some of them don't get in health insurance at all. They only have what their parents have bought for them or if they've bought a college's umbrella policy that, that any student could buy. The more responsible colleges pay all the health care costs of players while they're there. Virginia Tech's one, but not all. Responsible colleges would pay all costs of health care while you are on the program. And the day you leave the program, your coverage ends. And, and football players, not just degenerative neurological injuries, but many of them have degenerative orthopedic injuries that don't manifest for the next 10 or 15 years of your life. And you're on your own. The college doesn't pay anything, and the NCAA, don't waste a phone call to the NCAA because the only word they've ever said about health care is, is we deny everything. They provide nothing. They although they do, they, they do accept the $700 million a year that the basketball tournament brings them, but in, in return they provide absolutely nothing. Um, sorry. So I guess two questions in a comment. First of all, I think that idea with the incentive of the grade point average is a great idea. 
Um, but on the three-point stance thing, aren't you really just going to change offenses and defenses, make linebackers and running backs, you know, have more collisions and have more uh, concussions? And the defensive linemen and offensive linemen, they're not really the guys suffering from concussions as much, are they? And it usually the defensive backs and receivers. I'm glad you like my idea, so let's talk about the three-point stance. A, a, lot of, <laughs> a, a lot of people say, oh, there's still going to be collisions. Yes, there still will be collisions. And actually, one reason, there's a debate over whether the rate of concussions is increasing. The rate of reported concussions is definitely increasing. Is the underlying rate increasing, or has the problem just come out of the closet and now people are willing to talk about it, whereas they weren't willing to talk about it before? I think, and, 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 and a lot of people say the game think that the rate is increasing because the way the game is played is increasing. We have so many more fast-paced passing-oriented offenses. They, they snap the ball more often, so there are more plays. Passing offenses, are, there's a lot of crossing patterns involved in a modern, modern crossing offense. So before, where you had a running offense, the running back never got to full sprint. The linebacker who hit him never got to full sprint. They were both kind of stumbling when they collided. Now you get crossing patterns where the receiver and the running back are both running at maximum sprint and hit each other head to head. You get more concussions that way. So I don't think I don't think ending the three I don't think ending the three point stance is any kind of magic solution. I think it would reduce the number of head injuries, and anything anything that reduces head injuries is good for the sport. At least we have to try. We could do it for a year and see what happens. If it turns out there's some un, unintended consequence that makes things even worse, then you go back to the old way. Sir. If most of the action is at the high school level, isn't it adults that are making decisions to extend the season and to let little kids, you know, when I was growing up uh, 55 years ago as a 10 year old, there's no such thing as contact football until you got to high school. Uh, and that's changed over the year. Adults are making all these decisions. Is there any reform movement among uh, high school administrators and and high school coaches sort of, you know, codes of ethics. It seems to me the only metric they get evaluated on is whether they win. There's no metric about how well the kids do in school. There's no metric about how much character they build. There's no metric about how many knee injuries they have. There's no metric about how many kids take illegal food supplements to get bigger than college players were in my era. <laughs> so is there any reform movement in the coaching level or um, the school, it, high school administration? Is there a reform movement? I would say no, and I, and I think that's one of the things I'm looking for. Uh, I said before, and I, I go into great detail on this in the book because I think it's one of the key points, that's very cynical of adults to impose on children who don't un really understand what's happening around them a scheme that results in their getting injured, and then being, becoming less likely to make it into college. Uh, you look at, everybody knows the incredible girls' college success statistics of the last 20 years. Girls are more likely to get in college, more likely to do well in college. Uh, it can't, the sports can't be the reason for that because girls are also more likely to play sports than they were a generation ago. But there's one sport that girls don't play, and it's the sport that generates lots of head injuries, football. So. At the youth league level, wanting to have year-round seasons, at the high school level, wanting to have year-round practice, those things are done to make adults feel more important. They are not done because they're good for kids. And I, I give more, a lot more data on this in the book. It's, it's very cynical. Even, even a real progressive area like Montgomery County or, or, or Maryland in general, we're going in the wrong direction. We're allowing more football instead of restricting it. The, you, m anybody from my generation knows that the really admired athletes of my generation were the three sport athletes. There'll be a boy who played football, basketball, baseball, a girl who played soccer, basketball, and ran track. There are no male three sport athletes anymore. If you play football, you can't do anything else, and you can't be in the band, you can't be on the debate team, you can't do the school, news, school newspaper. And every 14-year-old boy wants to believe he's going to be a number one NFL draft choice. So if the coach says, oh, don't join the debate team, come to practice, that's what you do. And suddenly you're a senior and your grades are bad and you have no extracurriculars and you can't get, and you're certainly not going to get recruited to play college because that happens to hardly anybody. But then you don't have the regular requirements for regular admission. And the adults are the ones who are supposed to know that's coming. You can't expect a 14-year-old to know that's coming. Very cynical uh, on their part. Not everybody's like this. We're just, we're, uh, John and I were just talking about Dave Mancarini, the coach over at QO High School who just left to, to coach in a different area. Won a lot of games, 
also was very big on education, but he was a teacher in the school. Increasingly, high school football coaches are not teachers in the schools where they coach, they're just coaches. So all they care about is wins, and at the college level, almost all, at the college level, I actually think this is a, this is a minor scandal in itself. Not only are all the football coaches of all big college schools just coaches, not teachers, all the small colleges in the country now have football coaches who are just coaches, not teachers. They don't even teach phys ed anymore. All they do is football. All, you know, the Ivy League head coaches, the NESCAC, Williams, Bowdoin, Middlebury, all those wonderful schools, their football coaches, all they do is coach football. They're not teachers. I mean, that's, if your coaches were teachers, their incentive structure would be different. And that's, that's one of them. This is the kind of change that I think Everybody in the football system knows this has to happen. Nobody wants to be the one who has to carry the ball and do the work. That's why we need the White House to get involved. Whether Democratic or Republican president, this is the classic sort of issue that presidential pressure solves. Sir? Say there is no panacea and there is no um, involvement from the government. How? How long do you think that football could survive in its current structure at different levels? That's a great question. If you talk to the NFL guys, who are very arrogant, uh, they, they also produce great football. And uh, uh, I'll add again, nothing's more exciting than an NFL game. But the people who run it are very arrogant. They think there's no saturation point, that anything can be foisted on the public. Right now, there's 16 regular season games. That's plenty. That's 256 football games a year. They're all good. One reason that they're such high quality is that there aren't a lot of them. So each game is important to the standings. The league wants to increase the number. They want more teams in the playoffs. They want more games played. Inevitably, be more wear and tear on the bodies of the players. The league couldn't care less about that. They just want more revenue. And they're already all wealthy anyway. So you know, what's, what's their incentive? Um, so the league is completely convinced that there's no saturation point, which is exactly what the NBA owners believed 25 years ago. 25 years ago, ticket sales, ratings, everything for the NBA was increasing. They then went into a, a two-decade cycle of decline, which the league is only now recovering from. NBA thought the same thing. We can never foist too much of this on the public. And I think the NFL may find out the hard way that, that in fact, it can. Uh, there are many, many examples of business of history of co corporations or even whole product lines that seem to be indispensable and were forgotten a decade later. And, and I, th I think the nuclear bomb in the case of, of football is high school concussion lawsuits. If high schools suddenly stop playing football, the free junior league disappears. You've got to develop your talent somehow. Other sports, if you look at how Europe does basketball and soccer, at the high school level, very few high schools do those sports. They have affiliated clubs, but affiliated clubs you're talking about for, for 15 people who don't require any equipment. Uh, it, 15 people who don't require equipment, you can have a club. If you're talking about needing 50 people who need equipment and fields and everything else, it's kind of hard to imagine financing that if it's not enfolded in the, in the school system somehow. So, Sorry? With basketball having AAU now, don't you think that someone within communities would try to fulfill that role if the sport weren't in schools? Certainly if public schools stopped playing football, somebody would try to set up an AAU-like thing, and I think it would fail. I mean, maybe I'm wrong, but I think it would fail. It's just because football is so complicated. Hi. You mentioned you work a bit with ESPN. Isn't TV to blame for some of this, and, uh, and how would you reform that? Good question. How much of this blame goes to TV? I've been, I've been blaming the NCAA and the NFL, but what about their broadcast partners? And that's the phrase that's used. Bristol, ESPN headquarters, CBS, etc. They, they refer to the NFL and the NCAA as their broadcast partners. Now, how can you be objective about somebody you have a contractual business relationship with? In, in, in ESPN's it's not a, but well, let me say this. It's not a coincidence that the NFL has distributed its contracts to ESPN, which essentially is ABC now for the, for, the, for the purpose of sports. NBC, Fox, CBS all have NFL contracts, and, and a, ABC has NCAA contracts, and CBS does as well. That's all the titans of broadcast television. They're all contractually obliged and all benefit from promoting football 
I would promote football anyway because it's exciting, but they never mention graduation rates, they never mention injuries, or they mention it in the public affairs show that runs at two o'clock in the morning. Everything is sweetness and light, everybody's having a good time, because that's how you would promote, that's how I would promote the sport if I was promoting it too. But you think, well, ESPN, they, they, they obviously have conflicting loyalties, because on the one hand, they're, they're broadcast partners for all, for NFL and college football, on the other hand, they're trying to be a news, news organization. How do they reconcile these? Not particularly well. At least they try. And you, and you think, well, at least there's those great old-fashioned networks like, like CBS, the king of networks, and 60 Minutes. They'll take care of that. 60 Minutes has done two football pieces in the last three years, and they were both puff pieces to promote the Southeastern Athletic Conference, which CBS has the contract to broadcast. 60 Minutes says nothing about injuries and subsidies and the, the, the corrupting effect on college education, completely silent on it, because CBS as a network draws a great deal of its profit from football broadcasting. So that, that leaves you, it leaves you book publishers, the New York Times, Washington Post, LA Times, Atlantic Monthly, news organizations that don't broadcast football games, will report on what's going on with the sociology of football. Television is terrified of this issue. Sir? Oh, I'm sorry. I think I saw something that said 82% um, uh, of the people have never been to a, like an NFL game, but of course the NFL is the dominant sport in America. Uh, what do you attribute to all the like state legislatures uh, caving in to these billion dollar owners in respective sports, and Georgia being a prime example, and building them new stadiums when the stadiums in some case are only 20 years old and could be used for a long, long time, and that money's not going to education or other things. Yeah, he, he mentions there's a stadium controversy, I wish it was a controversy, there's a stadium swindle happening in the city of Atlanta right now. Uh, local politicians allow themselves to be swindled because the incentive structure for them is either I give away public money to this rich man who will then give me free seats to his owner's box and maybe let me ride on his private plane, or I get blamed, I'm the one who caused the Atlanta Falcons to move to Los Angeles. So, and the, and the debt for what I'm, the, the debt for the money that I'm giving away won't fall due till I leave office anyway. That This has happened in a number of cases. Mark Dayton, the governor of Minnesota, just caved into the Minnesota Vikings. But what's happening in Atlanta is that Arthur Blank, the owner of the Falcons, who's a billionaire, net worth, Forbes magazine estimates at $1.4 billion, has gotten the city council to agree to give him about a billion dollars over 30 years to subsidize his new stadium. And the, the most important news organization in, the, in Atlanta, the Atlanta Journal-Constitution, is completely cheerleading for this deal. And it can't possibly have anything to do with the fact that Arthur Blank is also on the board of directors of Cox Enterprises, which owns that newspaper. It just can't have anything to do with that. So this has happened in a lot of places. And it happens at the college level, too. Co legislatures give out, give more subsidies to, to college football while they cut money for education in general, in part because they want to sit in the luxury suite on game day. They're also doing it for the Braves. They're also doing it for the Braves, too. And meanwhile, I heard, you know, like the Braves are moving to Gwinnett County. I think their ballpark's 20 years old, and yet they're cutting education in like Gwinnett County. Yeah, and, and, and studies of, and Atlanta's a great place. Atlanta, as you know, it's just had a huge scandal in its public school system that if I were the mayor of Atlanta, the public school system and it should get my first attention and instead a new NFL stadium is getting my attention. Uh, and it also happens with college funding. It's, uh, but until voters rebel, Owners will get away with whatever they can get away with. The voters are the ones that have to, and it's not impossible. The, the state legislature in Florida two years ago said no to the Miami Dolphins who were threatening to move unless they got a big subsidy, and they didn't move. Everything's been fine. I think if, if state legislatures and city councils the world over would take Nancy Reagan's advice and just say no, uh, they, would, they would find that they didn't have to subsidize pro sports by someone. And the third, the final point I'll make is that studies show that if you have civic money to spend, a football stadium's based 
basically the worst possible way to spend it because it's only used 10 times a year. The biggest of all stadiums is the most expensive. Baseball stadiums aren't so bad. They're smaller, they cost less to build, and they're used 200 times a year. Football stadiums are almost never used. If, if you have X amount of dollars to spend, you're much, much better from civic economy standpoint to put it into infrastructure, bridges, roads, subways, school systems. Those are the things with an economic multiplier effect. Pro football has no economic multiplier effect. Uh, I'm wondering if you've thought through some of the positive um, virtues or uh, character elements that uh, high school students can learn from football, what those are, and if high school football is disbanded, what are the viable alternative ways that they could develop those characteristics that can help them later if in life. high school football failed I think that would be a sad day because there are hundreds of thousands if not millions of adult American men who learn self-discipline and teamwork in high school who look back on it and say yeah even though I got hurt and even though my coach was in it was in, in, insufferable man am I glad I did that because of what I learned about what it means to be a man and what, in a well-run high school program and Dave Mancarini's program at QO was one example you're not teaching kids how to win games. Yes, it's nice if they do, it's more fun to win. What you're doing is teaching boys how to become men. And a well-run program achieves that in a very positive way. So I would hate to see that lost. Can I take one more question? I think we're about done, so. I'm oh, sorry, um, you, you talk about um, the, the catalyst being high school concussions, but um, uh, you, you mentioned a, a, an incident that, uh, you know, a $5 million, uh, lawsuit but uh, I mean call me a little cynical but you know five million dollars to these guys is is nothing I mean, I mean uh, it, it was this an incident where uh, a, a child was hurt and there were very immediate effects uh, that five million dollars would be nothing to the NFL but to a public school system it is a lot so this, this is something that happened at a public high school system right. That, and that's a killer amount of money for any public school system. So they sued the, the school? Well, in that case, insurers paid, but it was a San Diego County system. The insurance paid the damage award, and then the, the county lost its insurance coverages as a result, and it's now up in the air whether there's going to be high school football in part of San Diego next year. All right, so, so you're talking about, like, you're talking more about a, a rebellion from the education system against football. Sort of, uh, well, just strictly in money terms. Now, right. set aside whether it's good or bad for education. Just look at the money. Here, MCPS is one of the biggest public school systems in the country. $1.4 billion, I think, is the budget. That sounds about right. But suppose you lost five, $5 million lawsuits every year. That would be big money even to a wealthy system like NC and, and Montgomery County Public Schools. That's the cost of running several entire public schools. How could you possibly shoulder that burden year after year? Right. Now, well, I, I, I sort of come from a country where, where sport and education are separate. Right. Issues, sort of, a, you know, there's, so there's no Here they're inter th th This is one of the things that's different about the United States than most of the rest of the world, that sports and education are completely intertwined here right. in a way they aren't in most of the rest of the world. Yeah. Um, Greg, I've, I've enjoyed everything you've talked about today, but one thing I, I kind of disagree with you on, that is the college level um, players uh, and their interest in education. I think um, the vast majority of these guys really aren't interested in education. Um, they just barely got into college because of their football capabilities or basketball or whatever. And um, I think the tutors do most of the work and the guys major in the easiest majors on campus. So I don't have any pity at all on their academic and their lack of pursuit. Um, is there, do you think there could be a, a backswing to the point where there's less and less emphasis on education? Because they're really just minor leagues for the pros. Most of them won't make it, so what, you know, type thing is the attitude of the, of the administration. Do you think that could actually happen too, where there's actually less emphasis on, uh, on uh, college uh, academics? I, w will there be a backlash against football being played at the college level? You, uh, you certainly don't see any evidence of it yet, but you also see college is an institution that is progressively, each passing year becomes more and more female. You know, if you think about the increase in female success in academics, for which girls and women mostly get the credit for their own efforts, but girls and women are gradually taking over academia, and they are not going to look as fondly on football as, as men have. But I'll, I'll, I'll close by saying, right to point out that there's, the, the, 
if you play football and you're smart, you can use that recruiting opportunity to your great advantage. There's two things you can get. The second is less well known. You can get a scholarship or you can tr trade your football ability for admission to a better college than you could have gotten into based on your grades. There are two carrots being offered to high school players and a lot of ones are smart and they take advantage of that and they do very well as a result. Thank you very much and if you like what I said, go buy the book, okay?